Take your Bible now, Colossians chapter one. Colossians chapter one. Can you guys believe it? We finished first and second Peter, only took about half a year, no big deal. And now we're in Colossians. And as you guys remember, we finished second Peter and second Peter gave us a command. It's his final epistle. And he said, but now grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. To him be the glory both now and forever. And that was the final verse. It came right after the second to the last verse, which is always how it works mathematically. And the second to the last verse was a warning from Peter. And he said, but beware, lest you also be deceived, lest you be led astray in the error of the wicked. Isn't that crazy? Peter who was commissioned by Jesus Christ to do two things. Feed the sheep, tend the sheep. Feed the sheep, tend the sheep. Feed the sheep, tend the sheep. And when he's feeding the sheep, he's giving them the word of God. He's pointing them to Jesus. He's telling Jesus, Jesus loves me, this I know for the Bible. Stop. Okay. He, yeah, Jesus loves me, man. Right? He's feeding the sheep, but he doesn't want to just fatten them up for the slaughter. So instead, in 2 Peter, he primarily deals with the heresies, the fallacies, the false prophets and false teachers, and the things we got to be careful of. Because not everyone's your friend. Not everything you hear is true. Amen? Amen. Now check this out. This one's worse. Not everything you think is true. That's for you to chew on. You know what I'm talking about? And you gotta take your thoughts and take what you hear and take what you think and take what you do and take what you decide and you gotta run it through the grid of God's word. This is it. This is the filter system right here. This is how we're gonna grow in the grace and knowledge, gnosko, that we know God and what he has declared for us to do. And he's not left us as orphans. He's not left us as those without a manual. How many of you guys, when you buy a piece of electronics or you buy a, a chainsaw or you buy something, man, you just start firing that sucker up, pushing buttons, put the batteries in. You take the manual and you throw it in with the styrofoam. How many of you guys, you throw the manual away, you don't even read it. Raise your hand. Let me see them. These are my people. These are my people. Okay? I don't know what's wrong with us. The heck's wrong with us? Well, I can figure this out. I can figure this out, you know, you're plugging things in. I love it. Color-coordinated RCA cables. Like, I don't need instructions. Red goes in red, you know, and the heck until until whatever it is you're trying to figure out it don't work right you know it doesn't work and so you got to resort to the manual you go back to the manual see how do I adjust this how do I get this working how do I correct this how do I get back to where it needs to go you can go on YouTube and fix anything man you can do you can perform your own surgeries on YouTube nowadays man you can get it all done you know (laughs) I'm kidding don't do that but the manual and I want you guys to know something Peter said grow in the grace and knowledge. The grace of God. That's just constantly knowing God's for you. He's not against you. He's your father. He's a good, good father. He's gonna forgive you. He's gonna cover you. King David said in Psalm 23, surely goodness and mercy shall follow me. How long? All the days of my life. In the presence of my enemy, he's gonna prepare a table before me. What the heck? Like, I'm good. I'm good. But I don't wanna be a dumb good. I don't wanna be a dumb good. He said, grow in the grace and the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And he wants us to apply ourselves to learning, to understanding, to study, to the manual. It's been said before that the B-I-B-L-E is the basic instructions before leaving earth. It's the Bible. It's the Bible. How are you doing this? How are you making up your decisions? How are you voting? How are you navigating your marital status? How are you navigating your political status? How are you making your decisions? Hopefully it's with this book. And Peter tells us to do that because we need to be adjusted from time to time. You ever gone to a good chiropractic adjustment? Remember a couple years ago, I was in Ashland, I was doing some lifts and working at a CrossFit gym, and man, I hurt my back so bad, I just, I picked up this weight, and I just stopped and went right to the ground, and the trainer's like, you all right? I'm like, oh, I'm all right, and, and I started rolling it out, and I said, hey, I can't even do this workout today, I gotta go, and he's like, can you sign the waiver before you leave, you know, and it was funny, I signed it and bounced out, and that was on a Monday, I remember I drove home, five-hour trip, and I couldn't even move, and on Thursday, the true story, on Thursday, I was standing over there in the foyer, and, and Paul Jones, who led our worship set today, he's a doctor, he's a chiropractor, and, and he saw me, he's like, how you doing? He's like, I'm all right. And he's like, you don't look all right. And I told him what happened on Monday. I hurt myself. And he called me. He said, you dummy. <laughs> We're that kind of friendship, you know, went to high school together. And he said, you dummy, you should have called me the minute you got hurt. He said, let's go. It's Thursday. They were closed, actually. At the, at the, and we went over the bridge, and he adjusted me. And he got me back where I needed to be. And immediately, things began to alleviate. Things began to realign. And there was an injury, there was something wrong, and there, an adjustment. And when you look at God's word, his word is 
by and large, a reminder of his grace. It's the mess, the good news, you know. Last thing we need is an overload of good advice, okay? Let's make sure we understand the difference. Good advice is what to do, what not to do, where to do it, where not to do it. Like, just do these things and you'll be fine, okay? That, that, that follows the good news. The good news is that Jesus died, he rose again, and that you can be saved by grace, not of works, lest anyone should boast. It's the grace and knowledge. And so once you understand the grace of God and you're saved by grace, there's nothing you can do to add to, nothing you can do to take away from what God has done on the cross of Christ. But he then says to you, don't be a dumb dumb. Don't walk around all bent over and hurt spiritually, all out of alignment, all jacked up. You need to be aligned. You need to be corrected. Second Timothy 3.16 says, all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine and for correction and for reproof and for instruction that the man of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. And his word comforts us and it feeds us, but it also tends us. Don't you love Psalm 23? When the Bible talks about your rod and your staff, they comfort me. Now, now staff is for, for leadership and, and guidance and let's go. And, and yet a rod would be for correction and discipline. Here's King David saying, I love your rod, man. It's so cool. The rod of God. When I just get right in the head. It takes some, takes some real experience with God's grace, his staff, his staff, he leads the sheep. Like, whoa, 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 don't go over there. Whoa, 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 don't go over there. And the sheep's like, watch me, you know? And you're over here eating stuff you shouldn't eat, and all of a sudden you feel the, the shepherd thump you in the head. Why are you laughing? You know. Man, it's, and it's, when you know God's grace, you know God loves those whom he disciplines. I remember when I got arrested in 1998 in Ashland for fake IDs, and, and I was just, I was, my life was spiraling out of control. It was more out of control than I had I'd realized. And the Lord needed me to crash and burn. And so when I got arrested, and I was arrested and released, and I wouldn't be sentenced to jail till later on after my, my court date, and, and I, I walked back to the dorms, and, and all my buddies, all my friends that I just met like three months earlier, my best friends in life, you know what I'm saying? All these guys in college. College is a joke, just like high school is a joke. All these, it's all just a joke, it's all a prank. It's gonna be a weird Sunday, guys. It's gonna be a weird Sunday. And I remember all these guys and gals were like, oh, Luke, that's too bad. You got arrested. And man, that sucks. And all this stuff. And, and in my heart of hearts, my deep heart, I said, no, it's okay. This is what I need. And they're like, what you, what's wrong with you, bro? What you talking about? And they did, yeah, so you guys don't even know me. You don't know, you don't know who I am. You don't know where I'm, I know where I, I know who I am and where I'm supposed to be. And this is not it. I'm off my path. I'm off my course. I'm off my agenda. God had called me at age eight to be a pastor. God had called me to his purposes, and I had done my own thing. I'd gone my own way, and I was paying the price for it, and they wanted to give me sympathy and empathy. Oh, man. It's like, no, dude, it's all right. This is the rod of God. This is what I need. I need to be corrected. I need to be, and when you realize that, but grace and truth, grace and truth, grace and truth. You can't have one without the other. One without the other is abuse. All truth, no love. It's abuse. All love, no truth. Again, spiritual abuse. You need both. You need to be aligned. How, how do we get aligned? How do we get adjusted? How, how, do, we, how do we find ourselves staying on the path, the narrow road? It's kind of like your car. How many of you guys have a car that if you are driving it and you let go of the steering wheel, like you start to drift? Anybody have one of those cars right now? I'm kind of like a tread maniac. I'll examine people's tread. Like anywhere I go, I'm like, look at their treads and if they need their tires rotated. I'm just kind of like, I'll be down looking at someone's tires, you know, and measuring it. And, you know, like, what are you doing? I'm like, I just want to see you, man. Rotate your tires, you know. And you guys know the tread pattern will wear differently based on your alignment. You can tell your alignment's off. And, and you can tell when your alignment's off, the tread's wearing, you're ruining everything. And guess what? I got some tools. I got some tools in my house. I got some screwdrivers. I got some hammers, you know. And I could take my car to my house when the alignment's off. I could just start beating that thing. Easy. No problem. Problem is, is it's not going to fix it because I'm not a master mechanic. I don't know how to fix the alignment in my car. But when my alignment is off, you got to take it to a mechanic, to a master mechanic, a specialist. Same with when you slam on the brakes. Anybody have one of those cars you slam on the brakes, you know, into the left hand, you know, oncoming traffic, and you got to get that adjusted. Let me tell you about Colossians. You guys are wondering what he's talking about here, right? It's this guy's problem. It's been a long weekend. Paul's a master shepherd. He's a master pastor. And God had anointed Paul to be used by God to direct the church. And I want to split some hairs and thread some needles here. God had primarily contracted Paul 
to pastor and to lead the Gentile church. Now, the Gentile church and the Jewish church are united in Christ. Peter was the pastor over the church uh, of the Jews, and Paul was the apostle over the Gentiles. And so what Paul was dealing with as the master pastor was a bunch of churches like Colossae and, and Ephesus and, and Thyatira and all these churches out in the world and, and the church at Corinth and the church at Rome and these churches that needed adjustments. They didn't have it all down. They were getting into their lanes when they shouldn't. They were drifting and they needed an adjustment. And so too, you and I, the way we find ourselves being adjusted is through God's word. You'll remember as we finish 2 Peter, and the reason why we jump from 2 Peter, if you're trying to figure this out, why would we jump from 2 Peter to Colossians, is because in 2 Peter, right before Peter said, grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, beware lest you be led away in the error of the wicked. Right before that, he said, just like brother Paul says, of whom his words are hard to understand at times, but Peter told us to read Paul in order that we might find ourselves not getting taken into a ditch. And so we're doing just that. We've gone through the book of Ephesians already. And so when Paul was in prison, he wrote four different epistles, Ephesians, Colossians, Philippians, and Philemon. And so we are gonna study Colossians, Philippians, and Philemon, and then catch up with our Ephesians study. You can download that on iTunes, Ephesians, or our website if you want to. But the reason we're doing this is that we might consult the manual, go to the master mechanic, which is Paul himself, and find ourselves navigating through this life in order that we might produce more fruit. So let's just pray real quick before we read a couple verses. And uh, I don't know how, how far we're going to get today. <laughs> we'll see. And uh, so, Father, in Jesus' name, we thank you for your word. You promised us that your word would not return void, but it would accomplish what you set it out to do. You told us that your word is alive and it's active, that it searches our hearts and minds, it discerns our thoughts and intentions. Lord, that your word heals us, it delivers us, it renews us. And so in Jesus' name, Lord, we submit to your word. And I pray for every man and every woman here and every child, Lord, and everyone that's watching online as well or will download or watch this later, that they would find themselves more in love with Jesus, more into your kingdom, and more available for your service, Lord. We ask all this in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Let's read the first eight verses together. And I'm gonna do a little bit of introduction. I listen to about five or six different pastors teach on Colossians, and they all spend a great deal of introduction time. Uh, and so I, I got some things I wanna share that I think are pertinent for our moving forward, but this isn't a Bible college setting. It's not gonna be a test after this. What I really wanna do is give you guys some fuel for your journey that will encourage you, that will get you realigned, get you adjusted, get you back on the path you need to be. Let's look at verse one. It says, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God, and Timothy, our brother, to the saints and the faithful brethren in Christ who are in Colossae, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. We give thanks to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, praying always for you. Since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of your love for all the saints, because of the hope which is laid up for you in heaven, of which you heard before in the word of the truth of the gospel, which has come to you as it has also come in all the world and is bringing forth fruit as it is also among you since the day you heard and knew of the grace of God in truth, as also you learned from Epaphras, our dear fellow servant, who is a faithful minister of Christ on your behalf. Stop right there, eyes up here. Paul begins this letter, and he begins it in such a way, you would imagine that Paul started this church. This is the church that Paul started. He's writing to Church of Colossae. I, I was here, I planted the church. It was a little life group, me and Epaphras, and we were tag teaming, and eventually I said, I gotta go, and you're in charge. Did you know that Paul had never been to Colossae? He'd never been there once in his life, but he knew that there was a church plant there and Epaphras was the pastor. We can piece that all together through the teachings of this book and Philemon and we realize that Epaphras is the pastor. And so apparently Epaphras traveled from Colossae to Rome where Paul was in prison and he had a little meeting with him. He said, hey, Paul, man, the church is doing great. However, there's some things that have come in that need to be adjusted. And so Paul stroked his magnificent beard. I'm sure he had a beard. I'm not sure if he had a beard, but he, you know, in prison, he's like, really, tell me more, Epaphras. And, and so he wrote this letter and he gave it to Epaphras and said, take this back to the church at Colossae to read it to them. 
Not just them, but the church at Hierapolis and the church at Laodicea, all these churches that are in this area. And not only that, but hey, Timothy, would you also take this letter? And he gave him the, the letter to the church at Ephesians. And he also took that letter and said, hey, give this letter to Philemon. Paul was in there writing letters in jail, theology, words of encouragement, words of correction, words of direction while he was in prison wrongly for being a Jesus freak. And here he is being wrongly accused, targeted, in prison. Things aren't going well for him. And what's he doing? He's helping other people. How many of you guys, if you were in jail, you wouldn't be helping other people? Instead, you'd be making a shank. <laughs> like you're in prison, you're like, I'm gonna help myself. You know what a shank? It's a knife. It's a, you know, it's a prison stuff, sorry. <laughs> and he's in, man, I just don't know if this is my reaction when things don't go well for me. And, and maybe Epaphras had to the, you know, arm wrestle, I'm like, just write my church a letter. I know you've never been there. And he opens up with these flowery words. And he, here's what he says. He says in verse three, we give thanks to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, praying always for you. This isn't a Hallmark card. Paul's not allowed to lie when he writes this stuff. Paul is saying, we are so grateful for you. We're praying for you daily. He goes on in the next couple of verses, and we'll study it in the next couple of weeks. He goes into the prayer that he's praying for them. It's an amazing prayer, one you should study, outline, and pray for yourself, for your spouse, for your kids, for your country, for your pastor, that we would know the will of God, that we would know his majesty, that we'd know all these things, this amazing prayer. And here's Paul, the apostle, contracted by Jesus Christ himself, imprisoned for the gospel and for the message of Jesus, praying for other people. On Friday, I was driving to Malala, as I mentioned. Some of you guys don't even know where Malala is. It's, I don't know where it's, I know where it's at. I know where it's at now. And as I was driving there, I was doing this wedding for, for a couple that doesn't live here. They live in Salem, and, and some, some of their parents go to church here, and, and they used to go to church here. And, but I'll be honest, it's, it, it, was a, it was a weekend. It was a weekend event for me. My family stayed home and busy. And, and as I was driving there, you got a lot of thoughts going through your mind. What am I doing? Number one, what am I doing? You know? I got a wedding next weekend, a wedding the weekend after that, and driving all over the place. And, and life's busy, and, and, and the Lord spoke to me while I was driving. He said, Luke, if you pour into this couple, if you pour into this couple, they're like 19, they might even be 18, now they're young, they have a little baby. It was the first wedding I ever did that we took communion after the wedding and then immediately did a baby dedication in God's name. It was, power, it was, it was powerful. And, and as I was driving there, I'm just, a, I'm just a human, so I'm just being real honest with you guys. I'm going to not be so honest with the next service. <laughs> I was just, you know, okay. And, and the Lord just reminded me how much he loves this couple and how he, he's asked me to pour into them, to get them going, get their wings open, get them flying, that God has a plan for their life. Outside of my influence, outside of my, my understanding, outside of my glory, outside of my experience, it's not about me. And as we pour into people, as we minister to them, as a matter of fact, I got there and we did the rehearsal and I, I got to go back to that. Man, the whole, the whole weekend was just really interesting. And I met some people I'd never met before. And I prayed with some people that I never prayed with. And I heard their stories and their testimony. I was talking with the groom's dad. I stayed, at the, I stayed at the groom's dad's house. And I'm just asking, where am I? Is this where it all ends for Luke Frechette, you know? No, no cell serve, no, I mean, we're in the middle of nowhere. And, and this dad, he, he might be watching online, he, he began to open up to me about his life and, and I began to realize that the Lord wanted me to minister to him and prayed for him, encouraged him. And here's my point. We get so wrapped up in our own selves so often. We get wrapped up in our own agenda. We get wrapped up in our own to-do list, our own busyness, our own responsibilities. It's, it's, what, it's what we do. This is why going on mission trips is so imperative. This is why going to a life group is so imperative. This is why serving in Sunday school is so imperative. This is why coming to celebrate recovery is so imperative. This is why going to a men's stake and study to see other people tomorrow night in Corvallis is so imperative. This is why it's so imperative to not just live your life for your own self-interest, but for the interest of others. Naturally, we are so selfish from birth. You ever seen a newborn baby? <laughs> Most selfish creature in the world. <laughs> Screaming, yelling. Man, if they could cuss, they would, you know. <laughs> if babies came out weaponized, I mean, they would just use, you know, lasers. And they're, <laughs> anyways. And yet God redeems us. 
Pastor Rory, our youth pastor, he, uh, his sister's Hillary, and she lives in Bend. And she posted a picture of herself in, on a mission trip a couple years ago. And, and I saw this picture, and she's really young, playing guitar. And, and it looked like she's playing guitar in front of maybe somebody that she was you know, visiting in this third world country. And, and, I just, and she said, I'm just reminiscent about this trip. And the thought that came to my heart was that that trip is still bearing fruit, not just in Hillary's life, but the lives of the individuals that she touched. Epaphras shows up to Paul. Hey, Paul, it's me, Epaphras. I, I know we've never officially met, and, but, but the crazy thing is, is you were in Ephesus for three years, and it was really powerful, and, and some people came to your services there, and then, then they came back to, to, to Colossae. You've never been to Colossae, and it's just a small little church, and now we're all messed up. We're all, and so, well, Paul, would you pray for us? He says, I have been. What? What do you mean you have been? Not only have I been, but I'm going to pray even more. Not only that, but here I am imprisoned wrongly, and I'm going to serve you, and I'm going to give this letter to you, and the Holy Spirit's going to anoint me, and it's going to bless you, and the people at Laodicea, and the people at Hierapolis, and the people at South Beach Church. And when we have this kingdom mindset, why do we do what we do? Why do we give of our tithe and offering? Why do we pray? Why do we abstain from certain worldly things? Why do we let the Lord search our hearts? Why do we confess our sins? Why do we humble ourselves? Why do we read this book? Because Jesus Christ has changed our lives and has contracted us, co-op, partnered with us to do the same in the lives of other people. Freaks me out to even stand on the stage and preach in this town. You guys know I'm from this town. This is where I grew up. This is where I lived. This is where I was a hooligan. And the Lord said, I'm sending you back. I'm sending you back there. Coming up on our 11-year anniversary of being here, and it's such, such a tribute to God's grace and God's kindness. Paul's never been to Colossae. You can put the map up there, Dave, if you have it. I want to show you guys this map of Colossae just briefly. You can see Smyrna and Ephesus on the far left. Laodicea, Hierapolis, and Colossae, kind of that uh, trinity of cities right there in the middle. Uh, you can see Sardis and Lystra. These names would come up in your mind if you've read Acts or uh, the book of Revelation. Derby, Iconium, Pisidia, Antioch. And Antioch and Damascus uh, on the right, I think it says Jerusalem too on a smaller image. So there's Colossae. This is modern-day Turkey. Okay, this is one of the most persecuted today, modern day, the most persecuted regions in the world. Okay, as a matter of fact, we know Christians who have been uh, stationed there, uh, living their lives as missionaries, and the government finds out about that. They say, hey, we found out you're here. We'd like to uh, walk you to the airport. You're no longer allowed to be here, kicking them out after being there for years and years and years. And this is where Paul started his ministry, planting these churches, and the overflow is still to this day being experienced, and there's still Christians happening, uh, Christianity happening there. As we, You can take that map down. As we study this book, I want you guys to understand a little bit of the heart and the intensity that goes into writing it. And there's a battle. Paul is writing to this church. We're gonna call this a polemic letter. That's P-O-L-E-M-I-C, polemic. And that means it's an argumentative letter. It's a letter that Paul's writing to this church because he's seen their x-rays, he's done the inspection, he's done the exam, he's put the car on the alignment track and he knows, okay, it's off by two centimeters. We gotta fix this sucker. We gotta fix this sucker. It's pulling to the right, it's pulling to the left. Things are wrong, and so it needs a correction, and there's an argument, and in chapter one, Paul's gonna argue for, number one, if you're a note taker, the supremacy of Christ. It's all about Jesus. The main thing is to keep the main thing the main thing, and the main thing, Jesus Christ and him crucified. I mean, that's it. That's like the main, stay on the road. That's the main thing. The main message is Jesus Christ. And this church had drifted into some other doctrines, right or left, and that's the main problem with the church. I'll give you guys the, the brief history because it kind of makes sense in our day today. Colossae was struggling with two different types of heresies, okay? One was pulling to the left, one was pulling to the right. The one that was pulling to the right is what we would call Judaism. Judaism was when a Jew would get saved and a Jew would come into Christianity and say, this is so cool that now we have our Messiah here. Let's make sure and, and, and continue to do our law and our ceremonial system and let's make sure and continue to be legalists so we find ourselves walking even more holy than God has made us through his son, Jesus Christ. And it's called legalism. As a matter of fact, Paul wrote a whole letter to a legalistic church, the church of Galatia. They were a legalistic church. They were a church that said, wow, God made rules? Cool, we'll make some more. This is gonna be awesome. We're gonna have a whole bunch of rules. And they were too far right, too conservative. And there is a temptation sometimes in our Christianity to get too conservative. Can you imagine being more conservative than God? Like God's pretty conservative. Like he's pretty, you know, he's pretty, he's, he's pretty, you know, you're like, I'm going to be even more conservative, you know? And like you start judging Jesus because he has long hair and wears sandals. Like he's a hippie, you know? And 
If you're more, and here's this, if you're more conservative than God, scoot over to the left a little. Just kind of ease up a little bit. If you made more rules than he made, you don't need to make any more rules. Stop making rules. And there's a legalism that can creep into the church. You're pulling too far to the right. But then there's a tendency also in some churches or Christians to pull too, too far to the left. Okay, Paul wrote another letter, not to Galatia, that was too far to the right, but he wrote another letter to the church at Corinth. The church at Corinth, man, that was church gone wild. They had their own YouTube channel. It was 18 and over. It was not good. People were, people were showing up to communion. They were getting drunk. One guy showed up with rings on his finger. He just married his mom and everyone's celebrating. And Paul's like, oh no. And Paul's right. I'm not, it's crazy. They were celebrating the craziest stuff over there. And so Paul wrote them, he's like, we gotta reel it in, you guys are too far to the left, come on over here, you need to be adjusted. And so in Paul's day, he wrote to the church at Colossae and they were doing the same thing. There was a tendency to become too strict and add more rules and become legalistic, we'll call it Judaic in their thinking. But then there was also a tendency, and we're gonna see it in chapter uh, two and chapter three, actually chapter three, here's the sins that he lists. Let's see if it hits you anywhere. He says, therefore, verse five, put to death your members which are on the earth. This is to the church of Colossae. Fornication, uncleanness, passion, evil desire, covetousness, which is idolatry. Because of these things, the wrath of God is coming upon the sons of disobedience in which you you yourselves once walked when you lived in them, but now you yourselves are put off these anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy language out of your mouth. Do not lie to one another since you've put off the old man with his deeds and have put on the new man, which is renewed in the knowledge according to the image that who created him. He goes on. So he lists this group of sins that may or may not have been happening there at the church at Colossae. And the reality is you and I, guess what, guys? We need to walk that road, stay on the road. I've taught you this over the years, that with every truth, there's two ditches on either side, excess and neglect. Okay, find the truth. What does God's word say? What does is, what, what is God's word demand? What does God's word command? And I want to stay there. And I can get on the right and become legalistic and I can actually go too far. I can ignore God's word and get too liberal and too, too crazy in my mind. And so Paul comes on the scene as the master mechanic. I want you guys to write down these four little truths. I don't know if I'm gonna have time now because you guys have been listening way too slow today. But uh, <laughs> here's four things you need to know if you're gonna grow. Okay, number one, you need to obey God's word. You just need to do it. Peter said, grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And most of us like, are gonna like, agree with that. You, you're, you're probably not doing it perfectly. Like, don't be a Pharisee. Like, you're not doing it perfectly. But in your heart of hearts, in your mind of minds, hopefully you've made this conclusion before. God said it, I believe it, that. That's it. Are you perfect? No, not at all. By grace, I'm saved. But uh, uh, do you understand it all? No, I can't boast. There's, there's some things I actually don't understand in God's word. I just, I'm not there yet. I'm learning. But God said it. I believe it. That settles it. He, he said it. He said, I say that to say this. Look at, look at verse one in the first word. It says, re- read it with me. What's the first word? Paul. Did you know that Paul wrote 13 letters of the New Testament? There are 27 letters in the New Testament, 13 of them written by Paul, almost half. Some would argue I'm one of them that Paul actually wrote the book of Hebrews. So he actually wrote 14 letters in the New Testament if you believe that he wrote Hebrews. And in 13 of the 14 letters, Paul begins every letter with this same word, Paul, Paul, Paul. This is how the, we, 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 we start our letters differently, don't we? We address the person at the beginning and then we end it with our own name, you know, sincerely Luke. And, you know, it's the opposite then. And he starts every one of his letters, Paul. I would encourage you to do this. Besides First and Second Thessalonians, Philemon, and one other epistle, one other epistle, maybe it's Philippians. Paul starts his epistle, not by just saying Paul. He says Paul, every single one, but he says this, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God. Now, an apostle is a big deal. And I want you guys to just pay attention quickly. There are two ways to look at the word apostle. Number one is the office of an apostle which I believe are the ones that God has reserved to be identified through Jesus Christ, his son. He identified the 12 apostles. Jesus Christ also identified Paul as I believe the replacement of Judas to replace that 12th apostle. This is the office of apostolic ministry. I believe it's only relegated to the guys in the scriptures, but there is also the activity or the ministry of an apostle. That is a pastor ministering to pastors, a pastor overseeing other churches, a pastor being a network of denominations or fellowships or people that are gathering together. And it's this gift of apostolic ministry. And I believe Paul had both of those. And so when Paul goes on record and says, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God, what that gives you and I a decision is, are we going to listen to Paul or not? Are we gonna obey Paul? 
Paul says some hard things. Peter already told us that. He's like, there's some things that Paul says that might make you mad, you know? There's some things that might confuse you, some things that you might not get. And I've taught you guys this before. If you haven't been confused yet, if you haven't gotten offended or mad yet, you're not reading the Bible right, okay? You're not reading it right. If you're not confused or mad, like, does it really say that? I can't believe it says that, you know? There's no way it says that, you know? I knew a guy in Ashland, he, he, he claimed to be a Christian, and every day he would open up his Bible and he would read the proverb of the day, which made him look like a Christian, you know? And yet I looked at his Bible a little closer and he had clips, paper clips, in his New Testament, clipping certain portions closed. And I said, well, what's, what are those, are, are those markers to save your spot? He's like, no, those are keeping Peter and Paul's writings closed, so I never read them. <laughs> and I was like, I've, I'm pretty sure Peter and Paul make up more than half the New Testament. You gotta read those guys too, you know? And he didn't want nothing to do because of their political stance, because of what they say about gender and equality, because of what they say about leadership, because of what they say about order. I heard one story of a pastor who was talking to another leadership team, and they were trying to fellowship and, and do something together. And one pastor asked the other, he's like, what do you think about Paul? He said, what do you, what do you mean? What do we think about Paul? I think, you know, I, I think he's, he's you know, a leader of the church. And, and the pastor clarified, he said, do you think it should be in the Bible? And the pastor's like, is this a trick question? I'm on candid camera, you know, is water wet? Is there an answer? What's the answer? Of course, Paul should be in the Bible. And he said, no, he shouldn't be. Paul should have been taken out of the Bible a long time ago because he's sexist and he's a homophobe and we're trying to remove him and his writings from the scriptures. Okay, right then that pastor's like, I'm gonna leave before the lightning strikes. I'm out, you know, <laughs> I'll be praying for you over here. And, and I kind of kid and make fun, but this is, people come to a conclusion. No, no, what, what Paul said, and he just, Here's the deal. Paul was called by Jesus Christ himself. Acts chapter nine is his salvation story. In Acts chapter nine, he's blinded for three days, he's scared, and Jesus speaks to him. And he speaks to him, and he speaks to a man named Ananias. He says, you go pray for Paul. You go pray for him, and you tell him all the things that I have planned for him, for he is my chosen vessel. I'm gonna use him for the Gentiles. This is, God's so funny. I mean, Paul was a Jew of Jews. He was a really good Jew. He was such a good Jew, he hated Christians. There's non-believers, there's believers, and there's real, real, real non-believers, okay? And that's where Paul fell into. And Paul was a real, real, real non-believer. And Jesus Christ, he sought him out. You guys know Paul's story. It's recorded in Acts chapter seven, eight, and nine as he gets saved. And in Acts chapter seven, there's a, a murder that is committed. Stephen, who's a witness for Jesus, a servant of God, a defender of the truth. And, and as they're murdering Stephen, the Bible says that they take their cloaks and they put them before a young man named Saul. It's, it's this man who wrote Colossians. And he's consenting to his death. The Bible says in Acts chapter eight that Paul was still consenting to the havoc of the church and the church was splintered at that time and spread out into all the highways and the byways. And Acts chapter one, verses eight was fulfilled and Acts chapter eight, verse one, it's a miracle through bloodshed by the hands of Paul. And as Paul was on his way to, to murder more Christians, to imprison more Christians, to do more damage to Christians, uh, the Bible says that he was blinded by a light, he knocked on the ground, and led to Jesus by his own voice. Now, when Paul was saved and his sight was returned to him, the Bible says he immediately was baptized. And he, the Bible says he immediately conferred with the Jews that Jesus is the Christ. Immediately. Jesus took all the knowledge, all of the, the wisdom, all, all of the power, all of the gifts that had been given to the apostle Paul, listen, and he combined them with the love of God. All wisdom, all knowledge, all power, all gifts. Paul was the smartest man ever to live next to Jesus Christ. Guaranteed, the most influential man ever to live next to Jesus Christ. And the first thing you need to write down if you're gonna grow in the things of Jesus is your understanding, your ability to read, to study, and to believe the writings of Paul. And maybe I'm talking to the choir here. Maybe you're all in it to win it. You're, you love it. Romans is your favorite book as well. And you, you love the epistles and you know, all these things are happening. Maybe you're still wrestling with that. Well, I'm not sure if Paul knew what he was talking about. I went to community college. <laughs> I got some ideas too, you know. I got some opinions. 
let me just read. I actually had a friend. He's watching online right now, a good, good friend of mine. He texted me back in February, and he said, hey, you know what? The Old Testament's awesome. I love it. It's uh, thus saith the Lord. I get it. And then the Gospels are awesome. It's, it's Jesus. It's red letters. It's awesome. And, and, and Acts is, is good. It's just the history. And he said, I'm struggling with this Paul guy. Paul shows up, and he's like, Paul, 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 what's, what, why? And so I told him, I said, read Galatians chapter 1. And I'm just going to read it to you quickly. This is what it says in Galatians chapter 1, where Paul says of himself, the, the way he introduces himself, he says, Paul, an apostle, not from men, nor through man, but through Jesus Christ and God the Father who raised him from the dead. He goes on in verse 8, he says, but even if we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel to you than what we have preached to you, let him be accursed. It's my way or the highway is what he's saying. These are big words from Paul. He says, if we have said, so now I say again, if anyone preaches to you any other gospel to you than what you have received, let him be accursed. For do I now persuade men or God? Do I seek to please men? For if I still please men, I would not be a bondservant of Christ. The apostle Paul. God (laughs) used him in such powerful ways. God chose him and saved him. Paul would not be stopped. Nothing could stop Paul. Not shipwreck, imprisonment, abandonment, defeat, failure. Nothing could stop Paul. And I want you guys to find that mindset. We're in Colossians. It's been a while since we've studied a Pauline epistle, okay? It's been a while, so I really want you guys to settle into this with me. And I feel, I'm gonna be honest, I feel in over my head teaching Paul's letters. I just do. Freaks me out. It's a big deal. Paul. An apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God and Timothy, our brother. Paul wasn't alone. He had Timothy with him. He had Epaphras. He had Aristarchus. He's going to list a whole bunch of people's names in Colossians. We're going to see that he wasn't alone. As a matter of fact, uh, he, he had companions that helped him. Paul wasn't also a big guy. He was a small guy. Uh, history tells us that he was short, bow-legged, had a crooked nose, wasn't, wasn't appealing from outside. As a matter of fact, they have uh, ancient uh, kind of paintings and stuff of him. Can you put that picture up? This is Paul and Timothy um, right here. It's coming up in a second. No. No, it is. It wants to. That's just me. Don't worry about that guy. Give me a heads up on that, on that picture. It, it's downloading from the internet or something like that. So, uh, But here's the deal. Notice verse one. It says, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ. Is that it? There it is. There it is. It's Paul on the left, and that's uh, Timothy on the right. At least I think. I'm not sure if that's actually them, but I want you guys to have an image of what Paul looked like. And You can take that down if it's not down already. It's good. It's good stuff. <laughs> Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God, and Timothy, our brother. Guys, I want you to just write these down. We'll study this out more next week because we're going to run out of time. I just want you to write these down for your consideration out of verse 1. If you want to grow in the things of God like Peter told us to, number one, you've got to obey the word. I'm just going to tag this on there, including Paul, if there's anybody arguing with that. I hope there's not. Okay? If Paul rubs you the wrong way, it's because you're wrong. I mean, how, how offensive is that? Like, it's pretty offensive. And we're so, we're at the council, you can't say that, Pastor Logan. <laughs> Man, I'd rather, you know, I'd rather be offended down here than be an offense up there. And uh, number two, I want you guys just to see this. He said, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ. You know who he's an apostle for? Jesus. And in your marriage and in your ministry and in your singleness and in your life, you need to keep your eyes on Jesus Christ. If you want to grow, you need to keep your eyes on Jesus. Listen, in everything. This is the one reason why things fail in your life. It's the one, it, I guarantee it comes back to your allegiance to Jesus Christ. You're struggling with an addiction? You're struggling with a sin issue? It's your relationship with Jesus Christ. Is your marriage struggling or things not as where it needs to be? It's because you're struggling with your relationship with Jesus Christ. Is your finances out of order? Is your pleasure out of order? Is your anxiety off the charts or the things out of line in your, in your life? It's because of your relationship with Jesus Christ. You find yourself getting swayed to and fro in this world, it's because of your understanding and allegiance to Jesus Christ. If you wanna grow, make sure it's to Jesus Christ. I've told you guys this before. If you're part of a ministry team because you like ministry, eh, that's the wrong reason. That's the wrong reason. People say, I wanna do Sunday school. I say, why? I say, I love kids. Well, you won't after Sunday school. (laughs) You'll be so mad. 
You do Sunday school because you love Jesus. You get married because you love Jesus. You stay single because you love Jesus. You tithe, you serve, you go on missions because you love Jesus. You serve your neighbors because you love Jesus. You abstain from the things of this world because you love Jesus. It has to be about Jesus Christ. That's gonna keep you. Number three and four, we'll study this next week. Uh, number three and four, I just want you guys to know this. If you wanna grow, these four things are what you need to know. Obey the word, keep your eyes on Jesus. And number three and four, know God's will and call on your life. And number four, rest in God's heart as a father. We see all that in, in verse one. We're gonna get through it next week. And I want you guys to wrestle with me in this. He says, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God and Timothy, our brother, to the saints and faithful brethren in Christ who are in Colossae, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Paul had to wrestle to find his will, that is, God's will. Paul thought he was in God's will. And I would actually go so far as to say in the sovereignty of God, he actually was in that season of his life. God was using that to bring Paul to where God wanted Paul to be. And right now in your season of life, by God's grace and his sovereignty, you're right where you're supposed to be. That does not give you a hall pass to stay where you're at, though. God's gonna meet you right where you're at. And if God can use Paul who murdered Stephen, if God can use Paul who hated Jesus to his face, if Jesus pursued him and said, hey, I'd like to change your heart so I could use you with the same energy, the same passion, and the same zeal in order that you might change the world. Yesterday I was driving in Malala. And I looked to my left and there was this, this homeless Middle-aged man, probably in his 30s. Is that middle age? Yeah. Whatever. <laughs> there was this dude walking, and I don't know nothing from nothing. I just thought, this is what I thought I saw. And he was dirty, real dirty. But he was walking with a passion and an energy like he was going either to do a drug deal or kill somebody. That's what it looked like. <laughs> and he was, he was walking. And my heart broke for him, and I thought, you know what? Wouldn't it be so awesome? if that guy got saved, and if the same passion he has right now to do, to do whatever he's doing, I, I don't know. I could only assume stereotypically, may, maybe wrongly. If God could use that man's personality, I just saw him, wouldn't it be so rad if God could use his personality and God could show him the gospel and God could clean up his life and he would, he would be a passionate servant and minister of the gospel of Jesus Christ. God can use anybody and anybody and everybody that would turn their lives over to Jesus and that's the good news of Jesus Christ, that if God can use Paul as an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God, he can use anybody and everybody and wouldn't it be rad if you looked at yourself in the mirror that way, you looked at your spouse, you looked at your kids, you looked at the people in our community said, I think God wants to use you. I think God has a plan for you. There's nothing that you can't have forgiven at the cross of Jesus Christ. There's nothing that God can't redeem by his grace and his mercy in your life. And that's the hope of Jesus Christ. When Paul started writing letters, here's what you should do. Here's when, when Paul started going to Bible studies, he would show up to Jewish Bible studies. Hey, it's me, Paul. I got saved. Let's pray. Everyone close your eyes. And everyone would close their eyes with one eye open. I ain't getting shanked by this guy, you know. I know what he's doing. And he's like, no, for real, I'm a, I'm a good guy now. Okay, I'm a good guy now, you know. Okay, sure. And it took him a while. Matter of fact, he had a buddy named Barnabas that took him under his wing and said, come with me. We'll, we'll do this together. He had a Barnabas next to him. He had a Timothy under him. He had Paul and, or Peter and James over him. Let's pray. Lord, I thank you so much for your word. I thank you for your grace, for your kingdom. And right now, Lord, it's such a, such a crazy time. And I, I bow before you with my friends. And, and like Paul prayed for Colossae, Lord, we pray for our county in Jesus' name. We pray, Lord, that your will be done. We pray your mercy and grace upon us, Lord. Right now is this pandemic, this COVID spike, it's happening all over. We just pray to you. We pray to you in Jesus' name. And while there is a homeless problem in our town and there is a drug problem in our town, Lord, and there is a divorce problem in our town and there is an immorality problem in our town, there is a perversion problem in our town, where there's a sin problem in our town, and we look to you in Jesus' name. And we pray, Lord, that your mercy, that your grace, that your truth, Lord, would have its way in our hearts. And it would begin with us. The Bible says, let judgment begin in the house of God. And so, Lord, we invite you into our hearts. Search us, lead us, guide us, and direct us. We do plead the blood of Jesus Christ over our body, mind, and spirit. Keep all things formed against us away. 
And Lord, may you use us for your glory. Soften our hearts. And I pray for every man here, every woman here. May they leave here saying, what's my call? What, what does God want for, for my life? So, so cool that God can use Paul and that God's using Pastor Luke. That's awesome. But who, who am I? And I pray in Jesus' name that men and women would grow in their call. They would grow in their call and they would walk with you and they would serve you. We thank you again for all you've done, all you're doing, Lord. Bless the babies and the kiddos and the guys and gals and all that we do this week. Bless the men at the stake and study tomorrow night. And Lord, all the things that we attempt, may you be right there guiding us and directing us. We pray all this, Lord, again. Thank you for Bookie and Teresa being here with us this morning. Bless them and guide them and provide for them. We ask all this, Lord, in Jesus' name, amen.